So let the voices of the faithful ring out. So from the wells of night to the gulfs of space, and from the gulfs of space to the wells of night, ever the praises of great Cthulhu, of Sarpagua, and of him who is not to be named. Ever the praises in abundance to the black goat of the woods. Ea Shub Nigora. The black goat of the woods with a thousand lungs. Down the onyx steps he comes, hearing our call, borne on the wings of night, out beyond space, out beyond the final gate, to that where Yaga is the youngest child, rolling alone in black ether at the rim to bring us tidings from beyond. Let us go out among men and find the ways thereof that he in the gulf may know. To my top, mighty messenger must all things be told. Through the gates of seven and nine, down from the onyx steps he comes, hearing our humble tributes to him in the god, Azathoth, he of whom has taught us marvels. Down the onyx steps he comes, hearing our call, borne on the wings of the night, out beyond space. HP Podcast. That was a clip from the HP Lovecraft Historical Society's film, The Whisperer in Darkness. Uh, which is the story that we're discussing here today on the HP Lovecraft Literary Podcast. I'm Chad Pfeiffer. And I'm Chris Lackey. And I'm Andrew Lehman. With us again. Hey, yeah. <laughs> he's back. Have a good week, Andrew. Uh, it was delightful. Thank you. <laughs> Just flew by. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew is the producer and co-writer of The Whisperer in Darkness, and, uh, and he's joining us again today. We're also lucky enough this week to have the music of Troy Sterling Neese accompanying the episode excerpts from his score. And our reader once again uh, this week will be Matt Foyer who is stars in that film. He does and does a brilliant job. He's great. Say so. He's great. And I'm in love with that guy. You're Really? You in love well, with him? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that uh, that clip that we heard from the movie is actually of the uh, the phonograph recording that gets delivered to Wilma right. from Akeley that has the sounds of these creatures speaking with a with a human being. Right, uh, played by uh, in the movie by uh, Daniel Kamen. Yeah, and and it's it's pretty creepy as you could hear. These aliens have these buzzing voices that are uh, there's just something about them that's so unearthly. It's as if yeah. normal speech organs can't produce these sounds. Mm -hmm. The phonograph arrived for Wilmarth around the end of June. He's been going through this correspondence with Akeley in which they've been talking about mysterious creatures that live in the area of his home and have been sort of stalking him in a way. Stalking in him ever since he found that mysterious black stone out in the right. woods one day. Yeah. And the phonograph he actually had to, to ship from another town because he thinks that this this guy Walter Brown, who might be an agent of the, the aliens, has been trying to steal his stuff and screwing with his mail. So he actually drives out to another town and, and ships the phonograph from there. Uh, it makes it to Wilmarth and um, he listens to it, and it, it sounds like some kind of ritual. And accompanying the recording, there's actually a transcription that Akeley has made of the words to kind of get help him get a better grip of what it is said, because obviously it's not a great recording. You have to imagine the circumstances under which he made the recording. He's probably, you know, hiding behind a bush some distance away <laughs> from the people who are mm -hmm. doing the actual speaking, and he's carrying like a 40-pound yeah, dictaphone. Yeah, they're huge. The dictaphones are big. <laughs> probably is a wind-up machine. He didn't get electricity out there in the middle no. of the woods. So, <laughs> so you know, it's, cranking the thing it, was, it was really very difficult did to you get guys... this recorded. <laughs> now, I've seen the movie, and I didn't see this in there, but did you shoot that scene where he was out there hiding in the bushes? <laughs> <laughs> no, we did not shoot that. Uh, time. Yeah. That's a shame. That's a shame. That, that should have been, been great. <laughs> that should have been. That would have been great. <laughs> <laughs> oh. One thing in the, about that recording I want to point out is that he notices that there's a guy with a very educated Bostonian accent that's part mm. of that ritual. And yeah. he m makes a mental note of that and then just kind of leaves it at it's, this point. The recording is clearly a mix of human voices and these strange buzzing voices. The stuff that they're saying is hard to understand under the best of circumstances, but it does seem clear that some sort of ritual is going on and the deities and creatures of the mythos are being referred to. So it's enough to pique his curiosity for sure. Right. <laughs> and actually, it says... He describes him as having a Boston accent, but he also at one point describes him as having a scholarly accent, which I, I don't know what that sounds like exactly. <laughs> Not like us. No. <laughs> You've never heard that accent on this podcast ever. That's why we don't know what it sounds like. 
Things are getting weirder as they get into July. He's trying to figure out how to send this black stone to Wilmarth, but the creatures are getting a little more aggressive. In fact, he's finding more footprints on his property and he's got these these police dogs. One day he comes out and there's actually a row of dog footprints facing off with like a row of alien footprints. Like there was some kind of standoff, you know, over the course of the night. And this is my favorite, personal favorite section of the, of the story is this slow, paranoid kind of stalking of, of Akeley. Really interesting to me. It's like the do- dogs are almost like the greatest heroes of the mythos. Because they, you know, no dog gets put in a straitjacket and you know has to go live in an asylum. I mean, they just take it on. They're not yeah. scared of anything. They take dog, down Wilbur. Yeah, Wilbur Watley. Yeah, no yeah. problem. Or Waitley, no problem. The dog just took him out. And these dogs, they're not fooling around. Like if they get their their maws on these guys, they're gonna kill him. You know, they do kill one. Yeah, they do kill one eventually. Yeah. It's so uh, it's like a video game or something. It just dissolves after. Uh, gets yeah. Killed. yeah, yeah. Well, you know, when you set up a story like this. You have to really disadvantage the character as much as you can. No matter how much he tells people that these things are real, they can't believe him. You know, that's the worst part of it in, in horror and science fiction. There's no evidence. Yeah, no. But you know that it's happened. Akeley does finally send the stone, but it never shows up. Right. And he doesn't know why, but he assumes. Well, no, there's a very elaborate story about a strange a man with a strangely sleep inducing voice yeah, talking yeah. to the railway agent and. Uh-huh. And after talking to him, the agent can barely remember what happened. It's as though he had been hypnotized or something. But uh-huh. that that darn package is gone, and nobody knows where it went or what happened to the strange guy yeah. or anything. Yeah, the strange guy is really interesting. Yeah. He shows up here, and he, he shows up later, and he's got some kind of thick droning voice. And it's but, not. It's clearly not Walter Brown. It's no. some other. It's some other strange guy, and this guy yeah. can put you to sleep just by talking to you. Maybe it's Ben Stein, because he keeps saying he's got this, <laughs> you know, droning voice. Yeah, he gives the name Stanley Adams. <laughs> he's a lean, sandy, and rustic-looking man. Yeah. But the package never shows up, and we get the impression that this guy made off with it. And that gets us into uh, Chapter 4. The unknown things, Akeley wrote in a script grown pitifully tremulous, had begun to close in on him with a wholly new degree of determination. The nocturnal barking of the dogs whenever the moon was dim or absent was hideous now. And there had been attempts to molest him on the lonely roads he had to traverse by day. On the 2nd of August, while bound for the village in his car, he'd found a tree trunk laid in his path at a point where the highway ran through a deep patch of woods, while the savage barking of the two great dogs he had with him told all too well of the things which must have been lurking near. What would have happened had the dogs not been there? He did not dare guess, but he never went out now without at least two of his faithful and powerful pack. Other road experiences had occurred on August 5th and 6th, a shot grazing his car on one occasion, and the barking of the dogs telling of unholy woodland presences on the other. Man, but he's start, they're shooting at him. He's getting shot at. Yeah, one has to assume that it's it's the Walter Browns that are doing the actual yeah. shooting. You know, since, <laughs> it's not cultists. Since yeah, the things don't gun, have opposable biggest. thumbs, it's hard to imagine them operating a you know revolver or anything. But somebody's shooting at him. Yeah. 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 In August, there are shots fired actually on it. It's not just on the road. There's actually some shots fired on his property. At yeah. yeah. And uh, when he comes out, three of his dogs are dead. He has to go to town to get more dogs. You know, I I get the impression that he's just anytime there's a problem, he throws more dogs at it. Well, who can blame them, really? <laughs> <laughs> they're the only thing that works against these, <laughs> apparently. Yeah, that's true. But they're, they're, I mean, this is some creepy stuff. They're cutting his phone lines. Yeah. Right. More than just interfering with the man. And every time he fixes them, they get cut again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, Wilmarth at this point is getting pretty scared. He's like, it's not a, yeah. it's not a uh, scientific curiosity for him anymore. He's actually really afraid for Akeley's well-being. Yeah, clearly Wilmarth, they've developed a personal relationship. Yeah. Wilmarth considers Akeley to be a personal friend, even though they've never actually met each other. No. Mm-hmm. But they form some sort of bond through their correspondence, and Wilmarth now feels personally invested in what happens right. to Akeley. Yeah, so he's saying, maybe I should come out there and right. at least help you convince the authorities that you're in real trouble. He gets a very odd telegram. It says, Appreciate your position, but can do nothing. Take no action yourself, for it could only harm both. Wait for explanation. Henry Akeley. And Akeley is misspelled. On the telegram, it's missing an e. Well, that could just be that could just be because it's a lazy clerk or something. You oh know? no! Well, they do a little investigation and they find yeah. out that the guy who sent the telegram had a very droning voice. Mm. So somebody's 
already starting to kind of impersonate yeah. Akeley. Yeah. Yeah, no, Akeley is clearly under close surveillance and his attempts to communicate with Wilmarth and presumably everybody else are being actively interfered with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Pretty scary because that means that these guys are reading the letters. They know who Wilmarth is. They know what his intentions might be. Yeah. They're kind of on his trail now. I, I wouldn't like that. <laughs> Percy. <laughs> no. And every moonless night now, Akeley's having gun battles. I mean, he's shooting. He's blasting out the window at different things. And uh, yeah. he's losing dogs. And then he, he details in one of his letters an incident one night. It says, uh, Dear Wilmar, rather discouraging P.S. to my last. Last night was thickly cloudy, though no rain. And not a bit of moonlight got through. Things are pretty bad, and I think the end is getting near, in spite of all we have hoped. After midnight, something landed on the roof of the house, and the dogs all rushed up to see what it was. I could hear them snapping and tearing around, and then one managed to get on the roof by jumping from the low L. There was a terrible fight up there, and I heard a frightful buzzing, which I'll never forget. And then there was a shocking smell. About the same time... Bullets came through the window and nearly grazed me. I think the main line of the hill creatures had got close to the house when the dogs divided because of the roof business. And what was up there, I don't know yet, but I'm afraid the creatures are learning to steer better with their space wings. I put out the light and used the windows for loopholes and raked all around the house with rifle fire, aimed just high enough not to hit the dogs. That seemed to end the business. But in the morning, I found great pools of blood in the yard. The side pools of a green sticky stuff that had the worst odor I have ever smelled. I climbed up on the roof and found more of the sticky stuff there. Five of the dogs were killed. I'm afraid I hit one by aiming too low for he was shot in the back. Now I am setting the pains the shots broke and I'm going to Brattleboro for more dogs. I guess the men at the kennels think I'm crazy. We'll drop another note later. I suppose I'll be ready for moving in a week or two. Though it nearly kills me to think of it. Hastily, Akeley. That I love that roof scene is really frightening. Yeah. Yeah, because he doesn't really get a good look at these things either in this. It's sort of he's sort of just shooting up crazy you know yeah, he he never he hears it on the roof and he never and it's dark out there's no moon he never sees anything he's firing blind out his own window yeah <laughs> hoping not to shoot his own dogs yeah. <laughs> it's pretty scary it's i do pretty scary and he's got to look really crazy when he's doing that too like ha -ha! <laughs> who's laughing now you know he's just firing out of the windows <laughs> i do i do have to there's one line that i really like where it says that uh, to steer better with their space wings yeah <laughs> Which makes sense. Of course, it. they're wings that they use for space, so it's harder for them yeah. to well, use them in, on Earth, but it's it's space wings. Earlier in the story, he's, he describes the wings as they resist the ether, but are you know no use for steering in Earth's exactly. atmosphere. And the, the ether, of course, is a, a non-existent medium that people used to think filled interstellar was in space. space. Um, you know, it's since been discarded as a scientific notion but when lovecraft wrote this story people still believed in the ether and these wings were apparently you know designed for working against the ether but not against air now another letter comes shortly after this where he says things are actually starting to talk to him at night right you know this th it's gotten worse than that now they're getting in his head and they're sort of communicating with him and, and they're saying you know you're not going to california buddy <laughs> we've got other plans we got other vacation plans for you they want to take him up to yoga. Yeah. It's pretty bad. I mean, yeah. it's a really kind of fatalistic letter. He's saying, I don't think there's anything I can really do. It's yeah. really sad, actually. He keeps saying in that letter over and over, I wish I hadn't become such a hermit. Yeah. That no one would, you know, no one's in touch with me and no one would believe me even if I got in touch with them. Yeah. They all think I'm strange and weird. And even if I tried to save one of these footprints, people would say I just made it up. You know, anything I could tell them, they'll say, well, you're just a strange old man who lives yeah. alone in the woods. No one's going to believe me. Sad. Yeah. Now he he does actually find a body of of one of the things. Apparently, a dog had eaten or, or not eaten, but attacked. Attacked. Yeah. I, you keep thinking that that's going to be the last letter that he gets, but then he gets another letter again, and then this yeah. is in the next letter where he talks about. Um, he he actually mentions that he got a letter from, from them. The things. Yeah, yeah. That they sent. Oh, yeah, they decided to right. start writing him. 
which is kind of strange. This is also um, the part, the letter where he talks about there's one of the dead things and he, he saw mm-hmm. it and he touched it and he tried to take a picture of it, but it didn't work. And, and he describes it. It was like a great crab, a lot of pyramided fleshy rings or knots of thick ropey stuff covered the, with feelers where a man's head would be. That's the, how he describes it. Yeah. And then it dissolves, of course. And so he can't. Yeah, before he could show anybody, it, it disappears over the right. course of and the day. But now, the, it, what about the photograph? Well, he tries to take a photo and the thing doesn't show up yeah. in the photograph. And and uh, this was another one of, of uh, another example of Lovecraft busting out some sort of real science to try to explain. And one of the things I, one of the many things I like about the story is, is that, you know, Lovecraft's explanation for why they don't show up on film is that their molecules vibrate at a different rate. Right. Um, than, you know, normal earthly matter. Mm-hmm. It's one of those great quasi-scientific explanations that's just plausible enough that you go, <laughs> oh, okay, I'll, yeah, I'll yeah. buy it. You know, yeah. their molecules vibrate at a different rate. And it's a quantum mechanics and the vibration of molecules in general. That stuff has, I mean, that stuff was all being invented in the 1920s and 30s. I mean, Lovecraft is talking about cutting edge science when yeah. he talks about molecules yeah. vibrating at a different rate. It's one of the things that makes this more of a science fiction story than a horror story because mm-hmm. Lovecraft is really bringing in scientific concepts of the ether and molecular vibration and right. interstellar travel and all this stuff. By the way, that was Matt Barisi told me that that's the reason that nobody knew Superman was Clark Kent is because he was always vibrating his face when he was Superman. He'd move his head back and forth really fast, so you couldn't really get a clear picture of what his face looked like. <laughs> Matt Barisi said that. He just he won't he won't admit that it's a silly concept between Clark Kent and Superman. He <laughs> argues against any you know notions that there's anything wrong with the Superman story. Anyway, Brown, that guy has disappeared now. Uh, something happened to him. Yeah. Well, don't forget there were pools of human blood in Akeley's yard mm-hmm. after yes. that last gun battle. Yeah. So, so it's it, possible that he shot it him. It could be that Walter Brown was one of the casualties in yeah. that battle, and that the aliens just dragged him away. There, I think he even comments on that. They're usually pretty good at. at Cleaning up, cleaning up after themselves. Yeah. yeah. So Akeley has this last ditch plan to use poison gas on the thing. He says <laughs> wow. he's mocked up. He's he's got a, a gas mask. He's made him for the dogs too. They, yeah, that, that doggy made, gas mask. A little bit made me laugh really hard. He made gas masks for the dogs. <laughs> Did you guys shoot that in the movies? No, man. <laughs> Yeah, the movie uh, version we we concentrated on Wilmarth's half of the story, <laughs> not so much on Akeley's half of the story. <laughs> I'm gonna make a sequel. It's gonna be all about yeah. the dogs with their gas masks, yeah. all the things that I'm interested in. He basically says, "Look, I'm gonna try the gas. If you don't hear from me, contact my son. Right. I, I think things are, are really gonna go down." And then we get to chapter five, where there comes yet another letter, but it's got a totally different tone, and it's typed, which right. is odd. It's never happened. Very strange, and. In this letter, Akeley says to Wilmarth, Hey, Wilmarth, you know what? I've been I've been silly. I've been saying crazy things. I'm so sorry <laughs> about all those letters I sent you. I, I misunderstood what was going on with these with these outer ones. They're actually really cool guys. And they they have this <laughs> this <laughs> this really cool perspective of how the universe works, and they want to usher humanity into this great age of understanding. They're totally on our side. They're actually not the bad guys. They're the good guys. There's this bad cult mm-hmm. that exists out there, which is called the cult of, of, of Haster and the Yellow Sign, and that yeah. we're, they're fighting against them. You know, those guys are the bad guys. These are the They're the ones guys. that have been stealing the mail and screwing Exactly. Up. Yeah, yeah. Right. And they want to interfere happen. with our relationship. Don't you know they're they're full of peace and love and they just want they just want to be friends and have a coffee or a beer with you you know depending if you right. drink or not and <laughs> well and yeah. he says you know so we we've got this improved we're we're actually talking to each other now yeah. you know yeah. instead of just shooting at each other so because of our improved relationship they've naturally chosen me who already knows so much about them mm-hmm. exactly uh, they they've determined that I should be their ambassador on earth and you know I'll, he'll be locutus of borg and he'll <laughs> he'll be the one to bring the news of their uh, benevolence to mankind and then he gives some more information about them that they're actually more vegetable than they are animal yeah they're more like a fungus or something than they yeah. are it's w- another one of these you know just plausible enough scientific explanations to explain why they look so weird and mm-hmm. behave so weird and can do the things that they can apparently do, like survive in interstellar space. Yeah, and he also says that they speak uh, through telepathy. Right. right, Which is their primary mode of speech. And they're experts at, it's it's a little like the mound as well, they're experts at surgery. It's very easy for them to take your brain out and 
put it in the thing and, and fly to around and to modify their own bodies to right, do exactly. you know specific kinds of work or whatever. So you know if they need to be able to fire a revolver, apparently they can modify their own bodies to be able to do whatever it is mm-hmm. that they need to do. Yeah, it's it's hinted that maybe they don't even necessarily completely look like things from their home right. world. I mean, they might just be specially modified to to be able to do this mining on Earth, but. It, it, in this letter, he also says they're definitely from Yuga, which is at the edge of our solar system. Right. Yeah. Um, and that one day when the time is right, they will permit human observers to detect right. Yuga. It's not even their home planet. It's just their nearest local base of operations. Yeah. And then Akeley says, let me get to the gist of this letter. Here's what I actually want to have. <laughs> Why don't you gather up all the stuff that I sent you, the phonograph, the letters, all the evidence... We need it because you and I are going to get together. We're going to kind of create a narrative of everything that's been going on here. But we need all that stuff. So take the train. Come on out. <laughs> bring it all in the police. And, and then we'll discuss it. And uh, don't tell anybody you're coming out here, by the way. And uh, everything will be fine. <laughs> yeah, so I'll see you soon with the photos. Oh, he keeps and, bringing it up. And, too. Mean, and meanwhile, pardon the fact that this letter is typed. My handwriting has grown too shaky of late. So I had to type this letter. And Wilmer even comments... He's like, you know, he's really good at typing yeah. for somebody who just got one of these machines. And yeah. then he kind of, right, he's like, well, he must have had one when he was in college or something. Yeah. <laughs> no doubt. Oh, Will Marth. <laughs> when I read this the first time, I thought this was excruciatingly dumb. <laughs> like, it was yeah. so obvious. On my rereading, I had none of that. I had none of those feelings. I think, A, Lovecraft knows that it's obvious, I think. Right. There's no trick here. It's no. when when... When Wilmer makes the trip, it's under a cloud that we know something horrible is happening, and that he's in trouble. And it, and it makes that portion of the story, in my opinion, a lot creepier. Because, you, I mean, you know, it's Akeley's not really the one writing this letter. They've already set it up by having the dummy, you know, telegram. Right. And then Wilmer said something in here that maybe I just didn't pick on before, where he says, well, it's possible that this is an imitation from somebody. He acknowledges it. He says, it's possible that somebody else wrote this. But if that's the case, then why would he openly invite me to his house? Because I'm going to see him. Now, at this point, they haven't established that these guys imitate humans or anything like that. Yeah. So it seems perfect. Well, even if it is an imitation, I'm still going to see the guy, so it doesn't matter. You know what I mean? It, it seemed like it was sort of justified and less dumb than I thought it was. It seems time. like, yeah, that he does know that this is a, a chance that Akeley might have been co-opted, but he's going to go out there mm-hmm. to find out what the hell's going on. I mean, that's what I get from it. I, I sort of agree with you, Chad. The first time I ever read it, I also thought, wow, this is so obviously mm-hmm. not really from Akeley. It's the sort of situation where, you know, when you're dealing with a protagonist who does something that you as a reader know is stupid, Mm -hmm. it makes you think, why is the protagonist of the story not able to see the thing that is so incredibly obvious to me? I mean, the the whole setup for the Vermont trip and, and, you know, the eventual discovery about Akeley that we make by the story's end is telegraphed so heavily. Yeah. The reader sees the end of this story coming from a hundred miles away, but Wilmarth doesn't. And it makes you wonder what's up with Wilmarth that he doesn't see this coming. But what would he do exactly? So he shouldn't have gone? Well, or I mean, it, it, you know, it's the sort of thing where it's a story. If, yeah, if, right. Exactly. If the protagonist behaves the way a person would in real life, then there wouldn't be a story. <laughs> so, you know. The fact is, too, he makes it out. Spoiler alert. Mm-hmm. He gets away in the end. You know, like. He, <laughs> yeah, right. It, it well, works we out for him. And he finds out the mystery of what's going on mm-hmm. with Akeley and what happened well, to him. All in all, it worked. It works out. He thinks he does. He finds yeah. something. He doesn't well, yeah, he finds, understand it. Not He doesn't qu- quite understand everything that's going on. But he, <laughs> he understands that it doesn't really work out for Akeley. And that's what he, yeah. you know, wanted to find out. Well, he decides to head out there to Vermont to take up the invitation. Yes. And to follow the instructions from the mysterious <laughs> typewriter yeah. to the letter. You know, yeah. he takes everything. He doesn't tell anyone that he's going. I know. The only thing that he does <laughs> is he says, I'm going to take a different train. I don't like that. I'll get me yeah. there too late. Yeah. But then he cables ahead to tell him exactly what train he's taking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they're, they're like, that sounds perfect. <laughs> we'll pick you up. <laughs> I will be holding a sign. It's totally misspelled. It's like <laughs> Will Marth with an E. You know? He gets on the train, and that, that gets us into chapter six. <laughs> so there's lots of description of Vermont, how beautiful it is. And he's he's an urban man, and he's going out into the and you know the antiquity of New England and, and where it's unspoiled and, and there's more nature. And as you two went out there to shoot the film. We did. Yes. Now, did you have any of these similar experiences when you were out in the countryside of Vermont? Or? How was that? It's certainly beautiful uh, country. Yeah. Lovecraft clearly had some real connection to the geography of New England and really perceived threats or, or hints of 
ominous suggestions or something. I didn't see them personally. I just <laughs> look at it and think it's beautiful. Mm. Why Lovecraft found the you know shapes of certain hills so ominous, so ominous, I, disquieting. I can't say I understand, but I certainly was struck with the beauty of the countryside. We shot on location in the very places where Lovecraft visited and wrote the story, and it was mm -hmm. hilarious. I mean, we went to the actual train stations and post offices that he names in the story, mm. and we saw the you know streets named Akeley and Good Enough, and you know all mm -hmm. these names that are in the story are lifted from the places where Lovecraft was when he wrote it. And it was a real treat to see the actual places looking, I imagine, pretty much exactly the way they yeah. looked 80 years ago when he wrote the story. But you but you hated it, right, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Some conflict. I think Vermont is stupid. He went out to visit uh, Vert, Vert Ornan. Was that the guy's name? Vrest. Sorry, Vrest Orton. Yeah, that was a friend. Back in, in 1928, he went out there to meet um, a, a friend of his, a correspondence, a guy that you know mm -hmm. he met through letters and things. And that was his big trip, out, his first big trip out to Vermont. And that sort of inspired everything that Andrew was just talking about there. When we get to Vermont in Chapter 6, after this train ride, that's when things really start to develop toward a climax. A whole new set of circumstances now. Will, Marth, and Ankley are finally going to meet. Yeah, finally, actually, after six chapters of exposition yeah, and, right. <laughs> and laying the groundwork, they are, yeah. our two main characters are actually going to come face to face. Right. He arrives at the train station. Akeley is not there to meet him, however. Right. There's a young guy with a mustache and a weirdly familiar voice. <laughs> Can't quite place it, but yeah. he swears he's heard it before. Right. Yeah. As I surveyed him, I heard him explaining that he was a friend of my prospective hosts who'd come down from Townsend in his stead. Hakley, he declared, had suffered a sudden attack of some asthmatic trouble and did not feel equal to making a trip in the outdoor air. It was not serious, however, and there was to be no change in plans regarding my visit. I could not make out just how much this Mr. Noise, as he announced himself, knew of Akeley's researches and discoveries. Though it seemed to me that his casual manner stamped him as a comparative outsider. Remembering what a hermit Akeley had been, I was a trifle surprised at the ready availability of such a friend, but did not let my puzzlement deter me from entering the motor to which she gestured me. He gets in the car with this guy. Yeah. They head off. A guy who he's never heard of before after months of correspondence right. with Akeley, yep. a total stranger who says, yeah, Henry Akeley's sick and he sent me to pick you up. Yeah. Okay. And he gets he's in like, the car. You're friends with that hermit who lives out there? <laughs> the hermit that Is doesn't there... have any friends? Yeah. You're his friend? <laughs> hmm. Okay. Hmm. Let me get in the car with you. So they do, and they get in the car. And then here we get more expansive kind of description of the Vermont countryside and, right. and the things that are out there. And, and it's, it's silent in the car for a while. But then when Wilmarth eventually begins feeling that disquiet that the, the nature can only bring to Lovecraftian protagonist, <laughs> Noyes does start to discuss things with him more. Yeah. It's almost as if he's sort of pumping him for information to an extent. That's Yeah, Wilmarth gets the feeling that uh, Wilmarth got in the car because, well, he seemed to think that Noyes must not know what's going on because mm -hmm. he seemed so, like, not panicked. But as they're riding in the car, Noyes is asking these questions that make him suspicious that, okay, yeah. this guy... This guy knows more than he's letting on, and he's somehow trying to get me to reveal what I know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they finally arrive at Akeley's house, and uh, Wilmarth is a little freaked out to be at the place that he's read so much about. I mean, obviously, he had a picture in his mind, and now he's actually here. And one thing that there's a problem with, there's no dog. There's no sounds. There's no sounds of livestock yeah. of, of animals. It's no like the birds, place is nothing. eerily quiet. Noise goes in and says, I'm going to go and talk to Akeley. I'll be right back out. So he's just sort of left by himself, standing out there looking around, noticing the absence of sound. Again, weird. Yeah. Very strange. And um, he looks down and he sees some footprints from the Migo and has to stifle a scream, he says. I think it's, <laughs> it's, it's one of the sentences in italics, I think, in the original story. Yes. Finally, Wilmarth sees with his own eyes direct physical evidence of the existence of these hill creatures. At the beginning of the story, he was denying they existed at all. Right. And yeah. he spent the first six chapters trying to come up with some rational explanation for mm -hmm. and now here he is standing in Akeley's front yard and there's a footprint and it kind of blows his mind. They were the hellish tracks of the living fungi from Yugoth. Oh, is that the italicized? Yeah. Yeah. That's the italicized. Uh... <laughs> That's a great uh, <laughs> delivery of italics, too. <laughs> I could tell that your, your yeah. words were italicized. The way said. <laughs> well, uh, Noise comes back out. Akeley, Noise hastened to inform me was glad and ready to see me. Although his sudden attack of asthma would prevent him from being a very competent host for a day or two. These spells hit him hard when they came and were always accompanied by a debilitating fever 
and general weakness. He never was good for much while they lasted. Had to talk in a whisper and was very clumsy and feeble in getting about. His feet and ankles swelled too, so that he had to bandage them like a gouty old beef eater. Today he was in rather bad shape, so that I would have to attend very largely to my own needs. But he was nonetheless eager for conversation. I would find him in the study at the left of the front hall, the room where the blinds were shut. He had to keep the sunlight out when he was ill, for his eyes were very sensitive. I guess I don't know much about asthma, but <laughs> that seems pretty extreme to me. You know, I thought it was, you know, yeah. you take a whiff off of one of those inhalers and you're good to go. Yeah, I, I know. You know, I've never heard of asthma causing swelling and I know. photosensitivity I need... and a fever <laughs> and you can't move. And... I need my inhaler and I need those bandages for my ankles. <laughs> Close the windows. I, I have a cough. Well, noise. Yeah, noise jumps in his car, says goodbye and takes off. Good luck. See ya. Mm -hmm. He enters the house. It smells weird. Uh, he notes that even the best old houses can sometimes have those musty smells. Yeah, farmhouse in backwoods New England. Of course yeah. it's going to smell a little weird. Nothing we can do about that. That yeah. gets us into Chapter 7, where the, the actual meeting is going to take place, and I think that'd be a great place to pick up in our next episode in this three-part <laughs> series. In this four-part episode. <laughs> covering H.P. Uh, Lovecraft's The Whisper in Darkness. Thanks so much, Andrew, again, for being our guest. And next week, you'll come back, right? Oh, absolutely. You know, I, I might just sleep here. Till what? <laughs> Yay! Uh, Matt Foyer, once again, thanks for doing the, Thank you the so great much, reading. Thank you so much, That's great. In your seductive, sleepy, mellow baritone? Be Maybe bedroom voice? I don't know. Strangely buzzing voice that you have? Wait a minute. Thanks again, for everybody, for tuning in. We'll be back next week. I'm Chad Pfeiffer. I'm Chris Lackey. And I'm Andrew Lehman. And this has been the HP Lovecraft Literary Podcast at hppodcraft.com. Thank you.